Hi, and welcome once again to our Bible studies here at Bible Talk. I'm so glad that you can join Alice and I. Yes, we are. As we, yeah, as we get into our Bible study of, the, of Paul's letter to the Romans. I think that this is going to be a true... I know it's going to be a tremendous blessing yeah, for me. It's going to be a tremendous study. And I pray that it's a tremendous blessing for you. God's Word should always be a blessing for you and to you. Because as Paul said, whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. Amen. So Father, we just praise you and we thank you, Lord God, for your Word. Yes, Jesus. For your Word made flesh who dwelt among us. We thank you for the gift of your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, Lord God, that your spirit would be manifest here and, and give us understanding of what you have revealed in earlier times. Lord, help us in this time in your word to just to grow closer to you, to have a greater understanding of your love for us. That like Paul in the letter to Romans, we would understand the power of your love in our lives. We just praise you and thank you, Lord God, for your presence here in our midst. And Father, we just ask all of this in the name, the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Um, as I said, we're, we're starting our study in the, Paul's letter to the Romans. <clears throat> Last week, we did a bit of an introduction. And if you, were, if you haven't seen that yet, uh, I think it would really be wise for you to take time at some point to go and watch that. Because it will give you a little historical background and setting for this letter that will help you to have a deeper understanding of what, yes. what God is communicating to us through Paul. It's amazing that, yeah. what that kind of information does when you're doing the study. It, it's important. It really, it really opens is. it up. Yeah. It really does. It opens yeah. it up. So it would be well worth your while. And, and again, remember that all of these Bible studies, uh, once we do them here, they remain up and available online at the Bible Talk website, uh, BibleTalk.com. So you can go back and review them. You can invite others to come watch them. Share it with others, yes. It's there, the Word of God. Amen. All right? Amen. So we are starting in Romans chapter 1, verse, verse one. 1. A good place to start. Amen. Before we do, <laughs> I just want to, I want to tell you these verses or share these verses from the Apostle Paul because they're really relevant to what we're doing. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 11, 1. Be imitators of me, just as I also am of Christ. And he went on in 1 Corinthians, or before that, in chapter 4, uh, verses 16 and 17. And Paul said this, Therefore I exhort you, be imitators of me. For this reason I have sent to you Timothy, who is my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, and he will remind you of my ways which are in Christ, just as I teach everywhere in every church. I want you to know that the message of Paul is consistent. Whether it's a letter to the Romans, whether it's his letters to people like Timothy or Titus, whether it's something that he wrote you know, 2,000 years ago and we're reading today, it's a consistent message from God for us. And he is saying that we should be imitators of him as he is of Christ. So when we read what Paul is saying, you know, this is not just historical, although it is history, mm -hmm. but it is instruction for us on how to be like Paul, that we might be like Christ. Amen. You know, Paul wrote to Timothy and said, the goal of our instruction is love. Well, God is love. Jesus Christ is love. Mm -hmm. So that's the goal of what we're doing is not only to understand His love for us more and more, but to be more and more like Him, which is love. Okay, so let's start this verse. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Paul. You know, Paul wasn't always Paul. No. Okay. <laughs> He was Saul. He was Saul of Tarsus. This is how he starts. Mm -hmm. He was named Saul, born in, in Tarsus, but raised in Jerusalem. All right? He wrote to the Galatians in Galatians 2.20, and he said this, I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. He said, I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live. All right? Saul of Tarsus set off on the road to Damascus to bind Christians, 
it says in Acts chapter 9, right? Mm -hmm. A 9 too. But it was somebody else who arrived in Damascus. Mm -hmm. That was Paul, the apostle of God. A new creation. Yes, he went there to bind the Christians. Mm -hmm. God sent him there to set the mm -hmm. captives free. You know, it's interesting because God spoke to the prophet Isaiah so long ago and said, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand, for God is with us. The devil schemes against you all the time. But whatever he does, you see, he's been defeated. He was defeated when Jesus was nailed to that cross. Is turned to God's purpose. As Paul knew and would write later in this letter when he said, all things work together for good for those who are called who love the Lord and are called according to His purpose. It's like Joseph saying to his brothers, what you meant, meant for, for evil, evil God, God meant for good. good. Absolutely. So, you know, Satan had sent Paul mm. off to bind up the Christians. Mm. God caught him in the middle of that trip, brother, <laughs> and changed him, sent him to Damascus direction. to set people free rather than to bind them up. That's right. That's the way God is, right? That's a miracle working God. He is a miracle working God. Mm -hmm. And then it said, Paul, we, I think we just mentioned this last week in our introduction. It says he's a, a bondservant. Paul, a bondservant. Well, at midday on that road to Damascus, Saul was confronted by a light that was brighter than the sun. That's what it says, right? Mm -hmm. A light from heaven. What he was confronted was, with was the light of the world. That's what Jesus Christ is. Jesus said in John 8, 12, right? He was confronted by Paul. Paul had been chosen. But he would speak later in this letter to the Romans in chapter 8 and say, whom God foreknew, he predestined. Now this is important here. Yes. All right? Paul's a bondservant. And we talked last week about what bondservants are, and I'll mention that here again. Right? Mm -hmm. You see, the Lord foreknew. The Lord foreknew that Paul would be willing to surrender his own free will. Just as when Jesus said to the Father, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will. He was surrendering his will. Jesus said again in John chapter 5, verse 30, he said, I can do nothing of my own initiative. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I do not seek my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Again, in John chapter 6, verse 38, Jesus said this, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So Paul would come to say, when he wrote to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, he said, For I, if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for I'm under compulsion. For woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So now he's saying that he has, he's under compulsion to preach the gospel. He has no choice. He has no choice because he surrendered his free will and became a bondservant. You see, Paul, it says, who lived as a Pharisee, right? According to the strictest sect of our religion. That's what it says in Acts chapter 26, verse 5. That's what it said, right? Paul lived as a Pharisee according to the strictest sect sect that there was. So he knew the Torah, the scriptures, the first five books of the Bible, he knew it backwards and forwards. So he knew that it was written. Listen to this now. This is the, the, the Word of God. Deuteronomy, starting in chapter 15, starting at verse 15, God spoke to him and said, to, to all of us, and said, you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God redeemed you, Therefore, I command you this day, it shall come about if he says to you, I will not go out from you. If a slave says, I will not go out from you, I will not leave you, because he loves you and your household, since he fares well with you, then you shall take an awl and pierce it through his ear into the door, and he shall be your servant forever. You see, it was a practice quite frequently in the ancient world because this, the slavery, servants, were very common. But it was also common for masters to set them free for any number of reasons. 
But if a master sent a servant free, that servant said, no, I want to continue. I want to serve you. Then they became that bond servant, a servant by choice rather than by compulsion. Right? Paul knew that. So when he calls himself a bond servant, it is in reference to this that he is willingly a slave of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul, for him, the phrase, Jesus is Lord, that's not a song title. It's not a pretty bumper sticker. It is the proclamation of his surrendered, victorious life. It was the cry of a life that changed the world. God has given you free will, and you're not under compulsion. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. That's what Paul said, right? You have the power, like Paul, whom you should imitate, to choose servanthood. Right. Choose it. To choose it. And that's where the true victory lies, in choosing that servant. Remember, Jesus set us free. He said, I no longer call you. He doesn't call us, or he calls us friends. Right. But to make ourselves willing, to say, to surrender ourselves to him as he did to the Father, and say, not my will, but thy will. I only want your will in my life. I did, by the way, uh, we're going to talk about, because it says, you know, call to be an apostle. I've talked about in other Bible studies how God is a God of good order. And the order is important. Oh, ter terribly important. Yes. So bear in mind that before he calls himself in this, in this letter an apostle, he calls himself a bond servant. Because if you think that you can find an apostle who is not a bond servant, you got it wrong. You have to be a bond servant before you can be an apostle. That would be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Wouldn't well, it would be. There's a lot of them going around. So let me just go back and try and remember this whole verse, all right? Paul, a bond servant, right? Of Jesus Christ? Yes. Christ Jesus? Christ Jesus. A bondservant of Christ Jesus. A bondservant not of a denomination, mm. nor of a particular church, or of some ministry, but of Jesus. Mm -hmm. You see, all too often today, a person's ministry is about finding a job. That's right. Rather than hearing a call. There's, and there's an, an, an enormous difference. There is an enormous difference. And I think this is one of the reasons that we're seeing such failure yes. in ministry. Such, I mean, you know, the, the amount of what's called burnout in pastoral ministry is astounding. We have to wonder, were these people called or did they just find the job, right? right? Okay. All too often it's about serving an organization rather than serving the King of Kings, mm -hmm. rather than serving the Kingdom of God. You know, not, uh, I guess, gosh, I guess it's going back a couple of years now. On one of our trips to England, you know, we've just returned to England from England recently. Um, the night that I arrived in England, mm -hmm. we tra we traveled from the United States to England, and as soon as I got there, before we even unpacked the bag or even put our bags away in the house where we were staying, a, a dear brother Joseph said, "Come on, we've got to go. You've been invited to go to this pastors meeting in Manchester." So we took off, and Joe and I went there, and me too. Pardon me? Me too. Wasn't that me too? I don't... Were you there that night? Okay. <laughs> so when I got there, they don't normally... That, they didn't normally have a speaker. Right, right, right. But when we got there, it was a midnight meeting of all these pastors from around the Manchester area. And they were there and they were talking about what they could do to impact the area. How, how, what effect they could have on the sinners. On all, and trust me, there's plenty of sin to go around over there. And I share with them a word that God had given me on the trip over before I even knew that I was going to be in this right. setting with all these pastors. He said, I'm giving you a word for the pastors. And I mean, the, the instant we got there, shoof, I was out to see these That's pastors. Right. And I shared from um, Ecclesiastes about, about Solomon, mm -hmm. how this man who was given the greatest gift of wisdom and Ecclesiastes 2 talks about how he had begotten why he had the wisdom. 
And he is the perfect picture, or, or imperfect if you want to use that, mm -hmm. of what ministry burnout is. Because in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, he said he just hated the work of his hands. Yes. He, there, was, there was no pleasure in his life at all. But in the beginning of that chapter, he talks about how he built houses for himself. He planted vineyards for himself. He gained wealth for himself. He gathered, it was all about himself, himself, himself. And his kingdom. And his kingdom. So what had happened? God had given him this wisdom to serve God's people. And he used that to start serving himself. And But that was the desire of his heart when he prayed uh, to God. That, when he first, yeah. absolutely. Oh, he started. Oh, absolutely. Yes. No, his heart was turned. It says his heart yeah, was turned right. by his foreign wives and the things and, and uh, you know the, the things that he did. But the fact of the matter is, because he was building his own kingdom rather than the kingdom of God, he had no pleasure in life. No, he was he was burned out. It was a burden. It was a burden, and that's what will happen if you're not serving Jesus Christ that's right. rather than serving yourself or some man-made organization. That's it. It, that may sound like a, okay, well, my man-made organization is about serving God. Mm, Listen to me. Not necessarily. The very first revelation of the devil in the Bible is, you know, in Genesis, it says that he was more crafty or more subtle than any other beast of the field. You truly have to watch out that there's not this subtlety, mm. that little difference that throws something off course. It doesn't okay? have to be a lot. It doesn't have to be a lot. It's about Paul served the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. He was not serving a denomination, he was not serving, you know, a court. What was the name of Paul's ministry? Oh, uh -huh, you don't know. <laughs> All right. Well, what was the name of his church? There's only one church. There's only one body. That's what Paul said. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. All right? All right. The next part of this first verse is, I'm sure your Bible says, called as an apostle. Right? It says as, but my, the as in my Bible is italicized. It's like italicized? Italicized. Italicized? Yeah. <laughs> it's italicized. <laughs> italicized. Italicized. The reason for that is it, it's not there in the original Greek. Okay. Not in any of the translations. You know, it's not there. It's put there because the as an in that sentence that you see in most translations is an addition to kind of suit our culture. It's not there in the Greek. My footnote says, for the as, it literally says, a cold apostle. Yeah, well, let me just tell you <coughs> what, this, what this is all about, right? Okay. okay. What men call you might inflate your ego. What the Lord calls you creates. Oh, right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. In this very letter here in Romans, Paul speaks of God who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. Wow. Romans 4.17. This is why I'm saying, I want to set this and see how this whole letter is so intertwined. It's not that he was called as an apostle. God called him apostle. apostle. And that created that ministry. That mm. created that thing. You know, today we think of these things, bishop mm. and, you know, the apostles and pastors. Mm. These are just things that are stamped on a business card. Oh, no, no, no. That's what you do if you're, you know, if man has called you that. When God. But when God calls you this, he is creating that thing in you. Mm. Paul was an apostle not because he chose to be an apostle. He was an apostle because God created. called him apostle and created that in Paul. There's a big difference. There is a big difference. And it's a big difference. You know, we've talked about this in a lot of other settings. Um, we talk about, you know, we're talking about having a school of ministry. Will we provide ordination through Bible talk? Absolutely. Our perspective of ordination is not that we are empowering somebody no. to do something. Only God do that, does that. Mm -hmm. our, our concept of ordination is it, we are recognizing what God has done in somebody. Mm -hmm. And recognizing what God has done in somebody, well then we want to be part of being used of God to equip those persons for the ministry that God has called them to. We're not making them that thing. Mm -mm. God has made them that thing. A pastor, a prophet, a, an apostle. God has made them that and created them that. And what we are doing in our ministry is helping to equip them to do the work that God has called them to. 
It's the watering. Right. Yeah. But somebody putting that name or that title on a piece of paper does not make that a fact. No. God's call makes it a fact. Mm -hmm. Ordination is the church recognizing what God has done. That's important. It is important. Because there are too many people running around today with too many titles mm. that have that has nothing to do with God's call in their life. Does that sound harsh? It may it may very well. But you want to, you know, take a little time and go back and find out how many times God talks about false prophets in the Bible. Mm. Pro prophets that he says, I did not call. Mm. I didn't put the word in them. Mm. Well, there's nothing new under the sun. The same thing that was happening back then is happening today. And that's why it says, there, you know, we are to test the spirits for many false prophets have gone abroad. Mm. Paul was an apostle because God spoke that into existence. Uh, okay. God called Abram, Abraham, the father of many nations. Genesis 17, 5. And so he is. Yes. God spoke that into existence. Gideon. Gideon's another one. You know, here he is in the, down in the wine press. And God says, as soon as said, oh, you know, you valiant, oh, valiant warrior. God spoke that into existence. Ministry is about, that doesn't mean you shouldn't desire it. Oh my goodness, you know, well, absolutely. It's a, it's a good thing if any man desires, you know, it's like Paul thing. says, the office of an overseer. We want to do that. Okay. All right, let me just get back here. Don't mind me, by the way. All right. This is another set apart. He is an apostle. He's a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called an apostle, set apart. The Greek word there, I've heard "ezo." Uh, it's can't translated in the King James Version, for example, as separated. Okay. And I think separated is probably a, a, better. a, more, a better expression for mm -hmm. what God has done. You know, we've talked. I just got through talking about Abraham. Paul speaks of Abraham here in Romans. Abraham, he talks about the righteousness and the faith of Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh, who is called by God, starting with his separation. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Genesis 12, 1. Now, the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, and from your relatives, and from your father's house, to the land which I will show you. God was... Separating him. Separating, him. separating him. Paul's life in service to the Lord started with separation. Separation from religion. Separation from ritual. Separation from pride. Separation from his culture. Separation from everything he was in order that he might be everything the Lord wanted him to be. Jesus was separated, wasn't he? When he came in for 40 days. But it's not exactly, yeah, absolutely. Listen, to be set apart, to be separated. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's not the same Greek word that's used here, but it's, it, it is the same concept as being holy. Right. Something that is holy has been set apart, been separated, mm -hmm. right? So, there is the, the holiness of this ministry, and it has to do with be, being set apart, separated from, separated from what? Remember, I, I read at the beginning of this, how Paul said he died and his life was hidden in Christ Jesus. He's separated from his life. Listen to this. This is Philippians. Um, I'm going to read from chapter 3, right? Verses 4 to 8. This is Paul writing to the Philippians. Although I myself might have confidence even in the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I far more. Circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. But whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish, so that I may gain Christ. 
What was Paul separated from? All things. Just thinking about that being set apart, it would be taking it and separated, it. it would be placing it somewhere else. Well, in, so you're being placed in Christ Jesus. Well, you are in Christ Jesus. Yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's taking you from, if you're separated, it's, I don't know. Um, you know, I mean, think of this. It's very simple when you stop and think about it. If you separate something from something else, you're you're moving them apart. Right, right, right. And and typically, if you're separating, if you're separating this from that, you're taking the this and moving it away from the, that. <laughs> uh, if I was a cook, I could talk about separating egg whites and egg goats, but trust me, I'm not good at that. Okay. But the thing is, what you separate is what you're taking away, away. from. Right. Not where it's going. To. Right. And if, if God is in the process of, in, of establishing somebody in a work for Him, mm -hmm. and He is separating them, He is taking them away from something. Right. Paul, he took away from all things, right? Yes. Yeah. Take you away from what? Take away Abraham. He took him away from his family. I said his culture, his, where, his land. Yeah. Well, Paul wrote and said, our citizenship is in heaven. Took us away from that culture and away from our land. Mm -hmm. Take you away from your families. It's not that you're supposed to stop loving your family or anything. But the simple fact of the matter is, and you know, I know I experienced this. I know Alex has experienced it. And the, uh, probably the majority of people that I know who have gotten saved, I'm talking about getting saved, yes. there's all of a sudden there is a separation from their families. Because the families, like in my case, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic. And when I got saved, I got very, very saved. And I got saved like that. And you know, everybody noticed the difference. Because there is and there should a be a difference. Yes. And when God gives you new life, it should bring about new lifestyle. Mm -hmm. And that new lifestyle should be evident to everybody. All right? But you don't do the things that you used to right. do. Right. The touch of God should be mm -hmm. evident in your life to everybody around you. Go r read John chapter 9 and see what happened with the blind man. And he wasn't even saved yet, but as soon as Jesus healed him, everybody knew about it. And if you're separating, I'm just thinking this through when you're saved and you're separated because there's family that they're not saved. So they're still doing the things that you used to do. Right. And it, there's a scripture that says um, a little leaven leavens the whole, whole lump. Yeah. So if you're left in that situation, you're going to get well, you know, it was Paul who wrote and said, contaminated. It was Paul who wrote and said that bad company spoils good morals. Right. And yes, the people you love, you know, that way can be bad company. That, there's no doubt about yeah. that. It, but the point is, it's not that God doesn't like them anymore. It's, of it's that there is it's a difference. Isn't it? Well, it, it is, but you know they don't understand. I'm just going to say that you know the people in my family, they could not understand what had happened to me, right, right. and it kind of challenged. Without me, I, I wasn't preaching against them or against what they believed. No. But I promise you that I was proclaiming what I believed. The instant that Paul got saved, he began to proclaim the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, people in my family didn't do that. And I want to tell you something. I come from a, from a family of a long line of old-timey mm -hmm. preachers that go back to the, the pilgrim days. Which you didn't know college. at the time. <laughs> no. But now, all of a sudden, it's like, okay, so people are upset. The fact is... They get convicted. Yeah, but, but it's like, you know, Jesus was teaching, and he was in a house, mm -hmm. and his mother and brothers came to that house. And somebody came into Jesus and said, you know, Master, your, your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside. And Jesus said, who is my mother and my brothers and sisters? Those who oh, hear and obey his word. Now, listen, the fact is, I said the goal of our instruction is love. So God's not trying to, to break a bond of love that was there. But just for example, I will share this very briefly. It should bring about a change. Mm -hmm. My father could not understand. My father was alive then and could not, for the life of him, understand what had taken place in me and in my life when I got saved and went off. And Alice and I gave away everything we had and went off to pray. You know, and I, as I was going into ministry, my father couldn't understand that. My father had been born a Protestant, converted to Catholicism to marry my mother, and he just he couldn't grasp this at all. Uh, but at the end of the day, without going through the whole story, I will tell you this. My father got saved. Praise God. And all of a sudden, I had the family that I should have had. Mm. My father became my brother. That's right. And will be my brother eternally. Oh, yeah. He awaits my arrival. Amen. 
on that great and terrible day of the Lord. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. So God broke that, that bond of a family that was, you know, that's in the flesh and took it and made a bond that will last eternally. There's a verse that Alice and I, as, I, as we're filming this, we uh, have just celebrated our, our 45th, I was going to say my 45th anniversary. Actually, it's our 45 years, one wow. month anniversary. How many days? What day is today? 25th, two days. <laughs> so we've been married for 45 years, one month and two days. And one of the verses that I truly love comes out of the Song of Songs, and it's, How beautiful is your love, my sister, my bride. See, God has created a relationship with Alice and I that goes beyond what we had when we first met, when we first got married. God has created a relationship between us now, a bond between us, a binding between us that is eternal. Absolutely. And that's the, that's the relationship we want. Yes. So, I mean, that was God's goal. Um, the relationships okay. we have here on earth are just temporary. I, I have Until. to say this, yes, because the fact of the matter is, I, I, say, I, I share this with people. This may, you may have to pray for me because this, <laughs> cry and love me. Okay. I didn't want to go to heaven. Oh, I remember this. I if I thought that being, going to heaven meant losing my relationship with Alice. I have to tell you, the love that we have for each other, first of all, Alice and I knew before we got married that God had put us together. Before we were saved. That was before we were saved. We knew that the hand of God had brought our lives together. The night that I met Alice, I went home and told my mother that I met the girl I was going to marry. I mean, this was uh, love at first sight. Um, it took a little bit of a challenge to make it work out. To I get didn't us quite in. hear that. Yeah, yeah. Alice yeah. hadn't heard that. She's a little slower than I am. <laughs> but, but in any event, I mean, we knew that God had put us together. So I'm thinking, well, the love that I have for Alice is a love that was God-given. It says, you know, Paul wrote, oh, guess where? Romans, mm -hmm. chapter 5, verse 5. He says that the love of God has been poured into my heart through the Holy Spirit. So I love Alice with the love of God. And it was inconceivable to me that God could say, okay, this joy awaits you, but it doesn't include Alice. That doesn't make any sense. And yet, I see the verses. Well, are, are they married in heaven? This was the question that people came and asked Jesus. Here's what the Lord spoke to me. I don't know what you call it. But here's what I know. I know, I know I am confident in Alice's love of me. And I know my love for Alice. But as much as I love Alice, I recognize the fact that my love is imperfect. Because right. I'm imperfect. That's right. And so is my darling Alice. So as much as she loves me, I know her love for me is imperfect. When we get to heaven, we'll put off the imperfect and have the perfect. When we get to heaven, I will love Alice with a perfect love. And Alice will love me with a perfect love. I don't know what you call it, but I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> because God is love. And we are made now in His image. All right? All right. So, let me try get back on track here a little bit. We are to be like Abraham, a sojourner. And a stranger. Oh, separation. I was thinking about family. All right. Now. Separate. Yeah, yeah separate. separate from family in order that God can restore and make that right family. Right. The same thing when Paul writes in Romans and says, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He's saying that we should be separated from that worldly culture around us. Paul knew scriptures. He knew what Jeremiah wrote in Jeremiah 10 when Jeremiah said that we're not to learn the ways of the nations, the ways of the world. We're not to be like them. So we're to be separated from the ways of the world. It doesn't mean that we leave the world. We're in the world, but not of it. All right? So this separation is incredibly, incredibly important because we can't be in the kingdom of God and be like the world. You know what you said before, what God calls is created. I mean, that yeah, is absolutely. so... It is. I mean, it's so profound because one of the things that he says so many times to us is to be listening. And oh. how important it is to listen. If we're not listening, we can't hear the call, and He can't create. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's right. Where does faith come from? I hear oh, it. Oh, where do you find that? In Romans. That's right. That faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word. It is hearing this call of God in our yes, lives. Yes. It builds the faith to walk in what God has called us. That's right. 
and then things begin to change. Oh my goodness, okay? yes. <laughs> So, our citizenship is in heaven. Yes. Our mind is supposed to be set on the things above. Amen. And the mind of Christ. On the mind, it's like all of these things. We are to come out from their midst and be separate. You cannot serve God and not be separate from the world. That's right. Doesn't mean you're not still walking around on that street or this street, but you're, there's a separation, a divide between you and that world. And the name of that divide is Jesus Christ. Okay, so we're to be like Abraham, a sojourner or a stranger. I was just going to say, we're becoming more and more like alien and sojourner. Well, that's exactly. And Peter wrote the same thing. In his first letter, he said they were supposed to be aliens. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote to Timothy, a people who know that their citizenship, their citizenship is in heaven, mm -hmm. where their home awaits them. Yes. This is not our home. This is just a place we're staying right now. So why was he separated? For the gospel of God. Mm -hmm. Paul wrote, in, in, where? Here in this chapter, in the first chapter of Romans. And so. he said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Romans 1.16. Salvation, that's the focus, that's the vision, that's the goal. Not by making Christianity pretty and attractive to man. See, Paul had read in Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 verse 2 says, For he grew up, this is speaking of Jesus, For he grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of parched ground, he has no stately form or majesty that we should look upon him, nor appearance that we should be attracted to him. The church today is working ever, ever so hard to make itself attractive to the world. Mm. That's not God the Father's plan. No, it is not. And Paul knew it. So he followed the plan of the Father, as is clearly evident in these statements of his. 1 Corinthians 1.23, For I, we preach Christ crucified to the Jews a stumbling block and to Gentiles foolishness. And again, in the second chapter of 1 Corinthians, he said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. That cross, the horror of that cross is the glory of God. It is that cross that we are so seem to be so ashamed of in the, in the body of Christ today. The horror of it, the bloody mess of it, and we try and make our churches prettier. The insides, the music, everything is about making it attractive. There's nothing attractive about Christ Jesus in the natural. Him crucified. God said he had no appearance that men should be drawn to him. Ah, don't get distracted by man-made programs designed to grow churches to grow their little kingdoms. Mm -hmm. Don't get distracted by a, a, attractive, mi attractive ministries that are now devoid of the gospel, mm. missing the word of the cross. There are gigantic churches, mega churches out there. And the reason they're gigantic mega churches is because they are not preaching the cross of Jesus Christ. They're not preaching the fact that man, fallen human beings, are sinners in need of a Redeemer. And that Christ on that cross is the only redemption available. They're afraid it'll turn people off. No, 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 no. It'll turn people on. It is the only answer. It is the only hope. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. I was just thinking about Paul saying, that if he could, he would give up his own salvation. For the Jews. For the Jews. And yeah, later on in Romans again. Right. But I'm just thinking about how we, how to be imitators of him, Paul, if we, we were to imitate him, when we get to the point where we we could, we would have to have that same sense, wouldn't we? At that, well, at we point? do. And, but the maturity of that sense yeah. is the fact that Christ gave up his life for us. Yes. Yes. But God the Father restored that life. So now we have that knowledge and that understanding. Mm -hmm. We have that revelation and we have understanding of that revelation. So the fact is, it says no greater love has this than any man that he give up his life son. for his brothers. Right, right. So, you know, we know love by this. That God loved us while we were yet sinners, sinners. and gave up Jesus Christ for right, us. Right. 
And that should be our attitude. That is the attitude that we are to have. Total self-denial, self-sacrifice. This is, you know, this is the word that's not being preached today. Jesus said, no man can be my disciple. Yes. You've got to pick up your own cross. You've got to deny yourself. You've got to die to yourself daily and come follow him. Our reward awaits us. Now, there's been a, just a lot of bad teaching that's going on in this past century. Yes. Yeah. About, you know, the great by and by. Oh, you know, God wants you to have it all. No, God wants you to have joy now. God wants you to have abundant life now. There is absolutely no doubt of that. But the devil in his craftiness and his subtlety has come in and made Christians believe that having that joy and that abundance is about stuff that the world has. No, it is about the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Amen. It is about having this abundance of love, of joy, of peace, peace. of patience, of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God wants you to be joy-filled. Mm -hmm. He wants you to have peace that passes understanding. He wants you to have that abundance. But it's not about what the world has to offer. It's about what only the Lord can supply. That's right. And He will supply all yes. of your needs through His riches and glory in Christ Jesus. That's a fact, Jack. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm, we're going to go on because there's a lot. You know, I, I'm just ended here in the, in the end of that first verse. Talking about the fact that so many churches today are shying away from preaching about sin mm -hmm. because it turns people off. Yes. Brother, if you don't, if you want to be that kind of people, you, you better just rip the book of Romans, the letter mm -hmm. of the Romans, right out of your Bible. Because I promise you that it's here that Paul says that the wages of sin is death. And he tells you that there's only one way to avoid that penalty, and that is accepting by faith the atoning work of Jesus Christ. Right. Christ and Him crucified. This very gospel that Paul is talking here, talking about here in this first verse in his letter to the Romans. This letter, I said last week in our introduction, truly turned the world upside down in the time of Paul, mm -hmm. in the time of Martin Luther, mm -hmm. and I promise you it's going to start turning things mm -hmm. upside down right now, right here. Praise God. If you will hear what God is speaking, not only to the churches, but to you, mm. because it will change your life. God's Word will change your life. You know what? God wants to change you. Yes. No, I'll tell you what He's promised in the letter to Romans that we'll get to. He has promised to change you, yes. to bring you from glory to glory. glory. For whom He foreknew, He predestined to be conformed into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. God is using His Word. This potter is, is shaping the clay that is your life to form you into the image of His Son, Christ Jesus. This letter is going to bring change in your life. And Father, I just thank You for that. Yes. I thank You for the power of Your Word in our lives. Thank you, I thank You for that Word of the cross, Lord God, that is so powerful. I thank You for the gift of Your Son, Christ Jesus, on the cross. It did for us what we could never do for ourselves, to wash away the stain of our sin, and I glory in the fact that you said, Lord God, not only that you redeemed us, but you will no longer recall those sins. You'll no longer call yes. them to mind. Hallelujah. I thank you for that gift, Father. You, and I pray, Lord, that we would be equipped by your word to go out and serve you by bringing the power of your life, your love, into other lives. And Father, I just ask that in the precious, precious name of your Son, Jesus. Hallelujah. Well, uh, this is going to be a detailed study. I can't believe the time is up. And I do want to remind you, uh, we welcome, you know, if you have comments or suggestions or questions, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. Let's make this as much as possible a dialogue yes. between us, not just a monologue. It's already All right? started. It's already started. So, be back here again, same time, same channel, next week, in the name of Jesus Christ. God bless you and goodbye. Jesus loves you. A lot. Hallelujah.